Alright guys, so check it out. Here we have the famous Theodore Roosevelt Dam, and today I'm going to give you guys a brief history on the place while I show you some old photos and aerial shots of what it looks like today. Here's where I'm going to start. It's tough to farm where there isn't a consistent, reliable source of water. Same for human civilization, too. You can't expand, you can't grow, you can't thrive without it. In the late 1800s in the Salt River Valley area, farmers were super territorial over water storage. What water belonged to who, etc, etc. This often led to disputes and wasn't really helping anyone. A fair, consistent, and reliable source of water was desperately needed. Now prior to the dam's build, farmers relied on their own custom irrigation practices. They also took advantage of reopening a lot of old irrigation canals that were originally built by the Hohokam Indians between 600 AD and 700 AD. The Hohokam Indians were a group of Native Americans that settled in the Salt River Valley, and because of their canals, they were able to service over 100,000 acres of arid desert land. And keep in mind, this was before any industrial technology, too. It was considered one of the largest and most sophisticated irrigation networks ever created. These irrigation practices worked here and there, but the biggest setbacks were not being able to sustain control over the water. There would be times where there would be massive flooding, and times where water would barely trickle through the canals. Getting your hands on good old H2O was like trying to get your hands on a PS5. Some were able to get it, and others got the shaft. You know who you are. You know. Anyways, this is where my main man Theodore Roosevelt comes into play. You see, Theodore Roosevelt was a president who was devoted to conserving our natural and cultural history, not destroying nature by any means, but also not to add to it either. He was a true advocate on behalf of the lands, forests, rivers, and any other natural resource that you can think of. He definitely wanted to preserve what was. Theodore Roosevelt knew how important a reliable water supply to the West was, and one of the first things he did when he was elected into office was sign the Newlands Reclamation Act. Known more popular today as the Reclamation Act of 1902, this was a law that provided funding for irrigation projects, such as the dam. Now before government would end up committing to financing and building the dam, they needed to be guaranteed repayment. This is where farmers, ranchers, businessmen, and other settlers came together and pledged their land as collateral to the government, as they knew it was really the only way they could protect their future and get a reliable source of water. They set their differences aside, and the rest is history. After scanning the Tonto Basin area, it was decided that the dam would be built where the Salt River met with Tonto Creek, where it flowed into a narrow gorge, known back then as the Crossing. This was an ideal place because it was so narrow and on each side it was surrounded by towering solid cliffs, capable of holding back such a massive water supply. Preparation for the dam really began in 1903. This included things such as establishing a roadway from Mesa to the town of Roosevelt. The road is known today as the Apache Trail. Really awesome, if you ever get the chance, you should definitely check it out. Also providing housing for all laborers, contractors, engineers, and other government officials. And last but not least, providing a little bit of a community. Other buildings that were built such as a post office, general stores, school, church, restaurant, drugstores, and heck, even a bowling alley. It took a while to get a town started and machinery and supplies to the area where they needed to be. But once they did, they were able to start construction. Stones that were used in the creation of the dam were actually cut straight out of the canyon walls. They were lifted into place via block and tackle and pulled along by a cable. And the first stone was laid in place on September 20th, 1906. Now heroic efforts of all those involved in this project did not go unpunished. After they got the first stone set in, they started to move at a really good pace and had an end date in mind. But Mother Nature had other plans. You see, there were actually multiple times where as soon as they would make a little bit of progress, floods would actually wash out all the work that they had done. Pissed off a lot of people. Now, the first time this happened, they actually had anticipated it and were actually able to get all of the equipment out in time so that way it wouldn't be washed down the river. The second and third time, though, they weren't so lucky. And in fact, here's an old photo I found of an old suspension bridge that made it so that way residents of Roosevelt Lake could actually get from one side of the reservoir to the other. This was also another structure that was washed away by the floods. It's also worth noting that the original town of Roosevelt was eventually submerged underwater, of course due to the slow rising water levels as progress was made with the dam's construction. Over the course of the next five years, laborers worked day and night and little by little the dam started to take shape. And on February 6th, 1911, the final stone had been laid in place and the dam was completed. Theodore Roosevelt actually rode in on March 18, 1911 to crown the official opening of the dam, and at 5.48 that evening, Mr. Theodore Roosevelt himself pressed a button that would allow water to be sent through the north gates of the penstocks, spewing water into the dry riverbed below. The dam was then named after Theodore Roosevelt for his efforts in fighting for the Newlands Reclamation Act. The final height of the original dam's construction put it at a whopping 280 feet. 
All right, now let's fast forward to a time frame that I'm a little more familiar with. Now, the dam maintained its original identity over the years, for the most part. Slight modifications were made here and there, but significant modifications to the dam began in the early 1990s. You see, due to safety and flooding concerns, it was decided that they would increase the dam height by an additional 77 feet, also allowing for more water storage. Since the dam also served as a roadway, alternative measures had to be taken before the dam could be enlarged. And that led to the construction of Roosevelt Lake Bridge in 1989. It was later completed in October of 1990. The bridge has a span of 1,089 feet, and today is still the longest two-lane single-span steel arch bridge in North America. There. That's a thing you know. Here's a photo from the book I'm reading on the history of Roosevelt Dam. This picture here actually shows the old route that actually went over the dam prior to the bridge's construction. Now once the bridge was completed, they were actually able to get cracking on the dam. Modifications to the dam began in spring of 1991 and were completed by April of 1996. The new height of the dam today sits at a whopping 357 feet, which makes it about half the size of Hoover Dam. Today you can still check out the bridge and dam. It's super easy to get to, and there is two separate parking areas where you can get out to get some pretty cool pictures of the dam and bridge themselves. This one right here is where you can park and get out to take pictures of the bridge, and once you're done snapping your selfies for the gram there, you just follow this road right here to the next parking area. There's actually a bathroom there too, so, you know, that's just always a good thing to know. And right here there's actually a little lookout point where you can stand and take a look at the dam and take some pretty cool pictures. It's a pretty spectacular sight. I've been there many, many times and it never gets old. Alright gang, so now we are kind of getting toward the end of this video. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, where can I get some damn bait? Eddie. Okay, moving on. <laughs> Not for reals though, if you haven't been here and you're planning a trip, it's also worth noting that there is a few gas stations, general stores, and restaurants in the area too, so you can plan accordingly.